hit again with mortars and machine guns and the company commander said this is pointless we must surrender we're not having any more killed and so somebody put the flag up and somebody did I don't know who, who or what or why because that time I was still I won't go back and say any more of how it happened but but I was concussed uh, and not really fully conscious uh, so I've had this second hand from other people but uh, the firing did stop uh, and we began to apparently uh, assemble ourselves together into a body, but then a German machine gunner fired a, a, a burst at us, and he only got time to do one burst at us because his offer, officer came, so I'm told, and began to kick the living daylights out of him because he fired after the white flag had gone up. But anyway, we, uh, we, we, uh, the company commander had said there is no point in carrying on, and that was the whole bit behind it. You, you fight while you can. No food, no water, so what? That didn't matter. No ammunition. That's the important bit. We had no ammunition, or we had no chance, so why carry on fighting with your fists or knives or whatever? So he said, surrender. Eight miles away to the north of Oosterbeek, the 4th Para Brigade was attempting a breakthrough. But they had come up against a tough German blocking line of the 9th SS Panzer Division, reinforced by armoured cars, self-propelled guns and anti-aircraft guns. The 10th Battalion began to attack the northern end, while the 156th Battalion advanced on their right. But against such firepower, the Paris stood little chance, and despite making a bayonet charge, they made no progress at enormous cost in casualties. The third lift had also been planned for Tuesday. Major General Sozobowski's Polish brigade had been due to drop a mile south of the Arnhem Bridge. But the gliders carrying the brigade's vehicles and anti-tank guns were to be dropped on the same landing zone used by the 4th Brigade, some eight miles away north of the river. To make matters worse, dense fog meant that the aircraft carrying the parachutists had to abort their mission, although 43 gliders managed to get airborne at midday. In Holland, divisional headquarters at the Hartenstein were unaware of these developments. But by the time the gliders arrived, the 4th Para Brigade had been forced to withdraw. With German forces snapping at their heels, there was confusion on the landing zone. British and Polish soldiers exchanged fire, resulting in casualties on both sides before order was restored. It was essential that they got themselves and their equipment over onto the south side of the railway line as quickly as possible. They would then be able to make their way to Oosterbeek, where the rest of the division was gathering. The only available route across the railway line was through a drainage tunnel a quarter of a mile east of Wolfhazer. So by Tuesday, that's the third day, and in the afternoon between, say, three and six o'clock in the evening, there were the soldiers of the 10th Parachute Battalion, 156 Parachute Battalion, and the 7th King's Own Scottish Borders, and some Poles who'd also landed with their heavy equipment on the Tuesday, all mixed up in this melee, trying to make their way across this railway embankment, under that tunnel, through which it's possible to drive a six-pounder Jeep, uh, um, through which it's possible to drive a Willis Jeep towing a six-pounder, provided you drop the windscreen of the Jeep, because the pressure was coming from behind me to the east from the division von Tetau and coming from the left of me from the north by the 9th SS division and other battle groups that were being formed to try and squeeze and compress the 4th Brigade. They couldn't get back to the Wolfhazer level crossing because of German opposition. And if you look at that railway embankment and see what a significant obstacle to movement it is to soldiers on foot, let alone people trying to drive vehicles, you begin to realise that 4th Brigade was effectively being boxed in and would have been incapable of escaping from it had it not managed to break south. But of course in getting over that railway embankment they exposed themselves to German machine gun fire, uh, the withdrawal was such that it had to be done in haste, a withdrawal is probably the most complex military operation uh, there is going to be done effectively. It requires a lot of planning. This one couldn't be planned because of time constraints. Uh, and it was done in contact with the enemy, which makes a withdrawal even more difficult. Someone pressed a panic button. It was all told to withdraw en masse. We get down to the railway at Wolfshazen, and by that, the other side of it is on the bank. And there's these little tunnels or culverts underneath to, so people can walk through. And you're getting. You know, we, we all went, we didn't know who was giving the order, we just followed the man in front. 
Uh, chaps are trying to drive jeeps over railway lines and God knows what. And we go on this coal and we double back on ourselves on the other side of the railway. But nobody knew what was going on. It was all mishmash. Uh, junior officers didn't know because they couldn't find senior officers. Senior officers didn't know, but what we didn't know at the time, that because the general had been hiding out cat or in Arnhem, the brigade didn't know what was going on. So really it was a whole mess up. We just followed the man in front. What did we do? Did you follow? Those jeeps towing trailers and guns and those individuals who on foot could make it through this tunnel did so and broke out in the open ground here to the south of the Wolfhazer railway line to be joined by soldiers who'd made their way across the embankment to my left and to my right and were spewing down the sides of the embankment having survived the heavy machine gun fire and mortar fire which the Germans were able to bring to bear on them and which cost so many of them either injuries or indeed their lives as they tried to cross the very exposed line of the railway uh, which sits above us here. And moving down here into the south area of the, uh, the area to the south of the Wolfhazer railway line on that Tuesday night, Brigadier Hackett consolidated what was left of his brigade uh, whilst he tried to work out how best he was going to draw them together and take them down as a cohesive whole uh, to join the perimeter, the Oosterbeek perimeter, the first airborne division perimeter that at that stage was beginning to firm up uh, around the Hartenstein Hotel headquarters and which lies uh, just a couple of kilometres uh, away, uh, slightly left of where I'm standing here. Fighting at the bridge came to a close during Wednesday. The Paris defensive positions around the bridge were now isolated from each other. Some fought on with knives or their bare hands, but their situation was now hopeless. There would be no last-minute rescue by 30 Corps. Ironically, just as German armour began heading south over the Arnhem Bridge, so the bridge at Nijmegen fell into Allied hands, and 30 Corps was once again on the move, heading north. Realising that there was no hope of reaching the bridge at Arnhem, Major General Urquhart decided on a change of tactics. Now his priority was to form a defensive pocket around the Oosterbeek area, with its rear to the river. In this way, the airborne men would be able to survive for a longer period. And should 30 Corps find a way through, then the area would form a vital bridgehead on the north side of the river. Operation Market Garden could still be a success. Gradually, what was left of the 1st Airborne Division began to form a defensive perimeter. The eastern side was defended by remnants of the 1st Para Brigade, 11th Battalion, who had arrived on the second lift, and what was left of the South Staffords. They had withdrawn from Arnhem with the Germans hot on their heels, forcing them to fight tanks at point-blank range. <laughs> 